Hey everybody and welcome back to our Sunday morning Devo series. So Barrett is out this week, so your old pal Jonathan's taking over again. It's going to be very exciting, so strap in. We've got a very excellent, very thrilling Devo uh, for you all that I'm, I'm so pumped uh, to share. Because today we're going to take a look at the beginning of the New Testament. So the New Testament is pretty important. You know, it's the second part of the Bible. We have Old Testament, we have New Testament, right? We all know that. And the New Testament sets the stage for eternity by telling the story of Jesus Christ, him coming to earth, him spreading the gospel message, dying on the cross, and then getting the church started up. I mean, the New Testament is important. And the New Testament begins after 400 years of silence from God to his people, to the Israelites. So the New Testament's pretty important and pretty huge. Today, we're going to take a look at the very first chapter of the New Testament, which is in the very first book of the New Testament, which is the book of Matthew. We're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to see how the New Testament begins. I mean, you would think it begins in a very important and huge way. 400 years of silence have just passed. The Messiah is coming to earth. I mean, it's got to have a pretty important and pretty huge opener. You'd think that, right? So we're going to flip in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to see how this New Testament opens up after 400 years of silence from God as the Messiah is prepared to enter this world and change life forever. We're going to see how everything begins. As we check out Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, read along with me. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the fa father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Solomon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Let's just hold up for a minute, because it goes on like that for another 11 verses. The first chapter, the first words of the New Testament are not some awe-inspiring epic prophecy. It is literally 17 straight-up verses of Jesus' genealogy. Now, what's a genealogy? A genealogy is an account of somebody's family, tracing it back by generations. If I wanted to find a genealogy of my family, we would just go back. Jonathan, the son of Ray. Ray, the son of, of Ray. I mean, my dad's a junior and my grandpa's a senior. And you get Ray, the son of Augustine. Augustine, the son of Bartolomo. And then the names just get more and more Italian sounding the further back you get. It's, it's insane. So, you know, if you want to think of your family genealogy, you know, you're blank, the son or daughter of blank, who was the son or daughter of blank. And, blank. and so, you know, genealogies just trace family lines back generation by generation. And this isn't the only place in the Bible where you have genealogies. There are genealogies in other parts of the Bible. And if you have read through the Bible and you've gone to those genealogies, you've probably noticed that they are incredibly boring to read. It's just this person was this person's father, and this person was this person's father. And it goes on and on, and it gets like really repetitious, and it can be super boring and super dry. And a lot of people skip over these genealogies. And so it's weird. You would think that the New Testament, that the book of Matthew, would open with something more intense or flashier than some boring genealogy. But unfortunately, because we we get too turned off because of the repetition of these genealogies, we forget that they actually display really a really important story and a really important message by going through these family lines one by one by one. So let's dive in here and see exactly what we can learn from the genealogy of Jesus. First of all, it's important to remember that the New Testament begins this genealogy because it's showing that Jesus does come from the Messianic line. Multiple times in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that the Messiah would come from the line of King David. And that very thing is, pro is proven here as Matthew charts all of Jesus' ancestors going back to David, and even before David, going back to Abraham. Well, when we look at the different ancestors Jesus had, we notice that there's an array of all kinds of characters. Some names are familiar to us, some names are not as familiar to us. 
What you'll notice when you really study these names and look at these people, those who have been spoken about in the Bible, there's all kinds of lifestyles. People came from all kinds of walks of life who did all these different things. We notice that there are both really good people and really bad people in Jesus' family line. It begins with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of whom are credited as being the as laying the foundation for the nation of Israel, which is really important and really huge. Abraham's always talked about as being faithful. Jacob as giving birth to the as as giving birth to the, the twelve tribes of Israel. These guys were huge and important and seen as heroes of the faith. And that's good, and that's true. They did awesome things, but also Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob struggled with doubt. They lied. Jacob deceived his brother and stole his birthright. Both Abraham and Isaac lied about their relationship to their wives in order to save their own uh, lives. Those guys weren't really upstanding moral citizens at the end of the day. They did great things, but they also did pretty you know, negative things as well. But we keep following through Jesus' family line here, and eventually we get down to this person called Rahab. And if you read the book of, jo of Joshua, you know that Rahab uh, was a prostitute, and that's not the kind of job anybody should ever desire. Yet, despite the fact that Rahab came from a less than wonderful way of living, she ended up helping the Israelites as they were coming into the promised land. And because of that, she was brought into the Messianic line. Her life started off pretty nasty, but she ended up helping one of the most important moments in Israelite history come to pass. She eventually... Uh, gives birth to Boaz. Boaz, who we know from the book of Ruth, is the husband of Ruth, and the two of them display a wonderful love story and show what good godly love can look like amongst people. So two awesome people in Jesus' family line. Well, Ruth and Boaz end up being the grandparents to King David. They end up being ancestors to King David, and King David is described as a man after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart. And there's so much good to be said about King David, and so much good is said about him in the Bible. However, what we notice as we continue reading here is that David, right here in verse 6, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. David did a lot of great things for Israel. He helped move the nation back to God and was the most godly king Israel had at their time. However, David also did some nasty things. His son Solomon, who came after him as king, was the daughter of a woman who was stolen by David from her husband. David and this woman committed adultery, and then David had uh, this woman's wife, or this woman's uh, husband, uh, get killed. So there's some weird moral things going on here in Jesus' family. We continue and we look through the different kings of Judah, and a lot of these kings were pretty nasty people. A lot of these kings lived for themselves. They committed idolatry. They weren't following the Lord. However, there are some kings uh, in Judah, like Hezekiah and Josiah, who were amazing kings, who were great and turned the nation back to the Lord. Ultimately, what we see here through Jesus' family is that you both have great people and pretty nasty people. You have people who make mistakes in there. You have people who came from pretty poor places of life, and then you have people who were literal royalty. There's all kinds of people in Jesus' family line. And did all of that really affect Jesus and how he lived? I'll tell you this, that the sins committed by Jesus' ancestors didn't shape who Jesus was. They didn't define Jesus. Just because Jesus came from a family of people who made mistakes didn't mean that he was bound to make those same mistakes. Now, he was the son of God, and that's true. He had that going for him. But I think there's a really important lesson that we can learn here about family. I don't know what kind of family you guys come from. I personally don't have a lot of believers in my family. And it can be easy if you come from a family of people who don't really go to church or follow God to get discouraged. Or sometimes we come from a family that is super godly. That's been going to church for generations. And we think, okay, well, my family has been going to church for a long time. I'm obviously saved. You know, I'm obviously a good Christian. Well, I want you guys to know that our families don't define us and who we are. Just because your family hasn't been going to church doesn't mean that you're destined to make bad mistakes and that you're not a good godly person. 
On the other hand, just because you've had a family that's gone to church or been godly for generations doesn't mean that you necessarily are a golden child. Our decisions shape us. Our family doesn't give us a ticket into heaven or, or not. It's the decisions we make. We get to choose whether or not we want to follow God. That's not a decision our family makes for us. And the great thing is, even if we've come from a, a, a tricky family past and not the best upbringing, that doesn't define who we are. It's being a child of God and being part of that family that defines who we are. Jesus himself had a pretty mixed family. Some great things went on in, in his family's past and some not so great things. But in the end, those things didn't force Jesus into who he was. There, there are all sorts of people who have came from tough family situations but still live lives that can honor and glorify God. And even sometimes these people were able to be an example to the others in their family and help them come to follow God as well. So don't be discouraged. Family is a wonderful thing. And it's a tricky thing. And it's a tough thing. We don't always get along with our family. But we should always be praying for them. We should always be wishing the best for them and loving them in whichever way we can. But also remembering that our family doesn't define us and determine who we are or where we go. We should seek the Lord in doing that and let him define who we are. We should join the family of God and let that be the family that defines the very essence of who we are. Look into your own genealogy. It's, it's a fun thing to do. You can learn a lot about where your family came from, but never let those things determine who you are. We're so much more than the past that came before us because, because Christ forges a new way for all of us. And that's the wonderful hope that we can have in him. And so I want to leave you guys with that. We hope you all have a wonderful week. Hope to see you guys out on Wednesday nights. Remember that you aren't defined by your family, whatever happened in the past, but you're defined by Christ and where he leads you to go. And he always leads us in a wonderful direction. We love you guys. Hope to see you soon. Have a great week.